you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How y'all doing today? Awesome, man. Merry Christmas. Thanks for coming out. I hope you had a great Christmas. And uh, hey, thanks for everyone who came out to our Christmas Eve service. Um, we appreciate it. Some people are like, y'all had a Christmas Eve service? Yes, we did. And uh, the most Beacon Hill way possible. We do food distribution every Friday and our food distribution channels were shut down. And some of our members were like, we can't let people go without food. So they said, we're going to do a meal. And so they made a meal for 60 people. And then I got another phone call from Hunters for the Hungry. They gave us 700 pounds of food. We also had 700 pounds of food lying by. It kept coming and kept coming. You can't outgive God. It's a blessed church. And so I'm thankful, man. I'm thankful uh, to be a part of this wonderful fellowship of believers. And I thought before we kicked off the service today, um, it's a good time, the last service of the year, to look back and look forward and some of y'all are newer here, you might not know, but five years ago when we uh, came to the well to start this church, uh, this place had a significant amount of unsheltered people, and uh, there was common to see drug deals being happening right on the streets. And so we made it our goal. Our plumb line is that everyone matters. You have, if you're here today, I want you to know that you matter. You have never looked at anyone who does not matter to God, and that includes looking in the mirror. You matter. So we wanted to make sure that everyone in Hopewell understood that they are loved. They are loved by the greatest love that they could ever know, even if they don't know it, and his name is Jesus Christ. So we want to shine the light of Christ in every part of Hopewell. And so we started by, by loving on the unsheltered community. And when we got here, there was over 30, I think, in the count, over 30 unshelters. Uh, that's the term we use for homeless people. We don't like that term, so we use unsheltered but there was over 30 here, and then when I counted um, last week, we had under five unsheltered people in Hopewell, Virginia. And man, we, we have seen through lots of people, um, man, just love on them, uh, help them get jobs, get off um, the streets and on their feet and into houses, and uh, the bonus and the main reason we're here, many of those 30-some people have come to Christ and know Jesus Christ, and they are homeless no more. And we thank you for that, we thank you for the hope that is in Christ Jesus. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for investing into our community. While we were doing that, we started handing out meals. We realized that Hopewell was uh, food poor and there's a lot of people that go without every week. And so we had a leftovers one week, we started handing them out. We made a deal, you come to church, we'll give you a meal. By the way, if you're here today and you need a meal, we have a home cooked meal waiting for you after service. We thank you for our team that does that for five straight years now. Thank you for handing out a meal every Sunday. It's, it's a fair trade, don't you think? You come for an hour and get spiritually fed, and then we'll get you physically fed. Jesus didn't just uh, feed people food. He fed them spiritual food. And so our goal is not just to get people off the streets, but to get people into heaven. And we want to use the ways that we do to shine the light of Christ. And so we started handing out food, and then really on Fridays now, man, it, it's a normal time to have over 5,000 pounds of food handed out. And people always say, where do you get it from? And they don't like my answer. I say, God. No, I, I, I know I know God, but where do you get it from? I said, dude, I don't know how people get my phone number. They just do and say, here's some food. Can you use it? And we have never had one person not have food that is in need that we know about. And that's our goal here at Beacon Hill. We want to make sure that as we start off 2022, that we are more invested into this community than ever before. We don't care if anyone in this community knows the name of Beacon Hill Church. We care that they know the name above all names and his name is Jesus Christ. Can I get a hallelujah this morning? And that is my sermon title this morning. Can I get a hallelujah? Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19 where we'll be studying verses 1 through 10. This morning, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand and one of the Beacon Hill team members will come and bring you a copy of the Word to use today. Uh, we always say here every week to keep your Bibles open because I don't want you to follow the preacher. I want you to follow Jesus and everything that I say will line up to the Word of God because it is Jesus that can change anybody's life in here. Amen? And so I'm excited this morning. If you're able, we're going to stand in honor of reading God's Word, Revelation 19, 1 through 10, as we get started. 
I told my wife last night, uh, I said, I don't want to go to bed tonight because I just want to preach. And uh, I about came up here at midnight just to start preaching because I, I miss being in the house of the Lord. And so I'm thankful to be here today. Revelation 19, 1 through 10, the word says, after this, I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. A second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Do you get a theme here today? A voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all his servants and the ones who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, hallelujah, because our Lord God, the almighty reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is working in this place, and Lord, evident already in the beginning of our service today. Lord, we pray that you will be glorified through everything that is said and uh, done here today. Lord, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase, and you would get all the glory. I pray that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I can't think of a better way to end the year to be having a, a new beginning in a life in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I trust the Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of the hearers today, convict the souls. Lord, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass. Praise the Lord from heaven, you great sea creatures and all depths, fire and hail, snow and mist, storm wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people, princes and the rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, all men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is to be exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord this morning, church. We were, we were created to worship him and to praise him with everything that we have and all that we are. We're to praise the Lord, church. I didn't pick this, this verse out. If you know anything about our church, we just go verse by verse through the Bible, and God knew that we would end this year with this specific passage here in Revelation 19, 1 through 10, where the focus is simply on praising the Lord. I think I'm not big on New Year's resolutions, as you can tell. I break one of them every single year. But as we go into 2022, I think there's one resolution that you and I should try to keep, and that is in 2022, we will keep praising the Lord. Are you with me in here today? Look, the first words that John hears here in Revelation 19 is the untranslated Hebrew word, Praise the Lord. It is a beautiful thing. We, we see it often in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms like Psalm 148 that I just recited. But this is the only chapter, this is the only chapter in all of the New Testament that uses the Hebrew word hallelujah. Just as the Psalms often say to praise the Lord and then give a reason why the Lord should be praised, the same is true 
in our text today. We're going to be taught to praise the Lord, and then we're going to be told why we should be praising the Lord. And I think that's a good reminder to us, because sometimes in life, we can get into ruts. You ever been in a spiritual rut? We can almost forget to praise the Lord. But yet my Bible says to praise him in all seasons. So I think it's a good reminder for us that we need to praise the Lord. First of all, the word says in verses one through two, if you have your Bibles open, to praise him for who he is and what he has done. The first two verses says, after this I heard something like the loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. See, as we dive into Revelation 19, verse 1, we see the words after this. When we see after this in the Bible, it generally means like a change of, of scenery, a change of time. So we're going from the destruction of Babylon on earth to what is in happening in heaven. And what we see happening in heaven is that people are praising the Lord. See, when God's plague strike the earth, there's nothing left but total distress and devastation on earth, but in heaven there are countless multitudes raising a consistent, a constant hallelujah. And they are not saying hallelujah for the destruction that is happening. They're not, they're not saying praise God, those people deserve it, and they, they get, they're praising God because of God, that God is who he says he is. He is God. You can count on God when you can count on nothing else, church. The end of verse one, here's the multitude praising God for salvation. You know that God planned salvation before the very beginning of the world? This is not my words, y'all. And here in the Bible, all, in this church, I always tell you to open up the Bible and see. God planned salvation from the very beginning. Ephesians 1, four through five says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. While God the Father and God the Son are equally praised, throughout Revelation, here we see the focus being on God the Father. When the human race plunged into sin and there was no hope for a lost and broken world, God the Father said, I already thought of this, I've got a solution for the problem. God the Father stood ready to redeem his people. And I hope you never get tired of this church. I hope you never get tired of hearing me say this every single week. When we were without hope, God provided us hope in the name of Jesus Christ. While there was no way for us to get to him, he made a way for us to be with him. We couldn't get up the mountain, so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, down the mountain so that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I praise God this morning for salvation, church. He didn't send one of the extra son. He didn't say, you've been ticking me off lately. You're the one that's gonna go down there. No, he sent his only begotten son. That's a sacrifice so that you and I could be here in Hopewell, Virginia this morning praising his holy name. Thank you. Are you thankful for salvation this morning? Verse two says that it elaborates further by reminding us that his judgments are true and righteous. He doesn't let the guilty go unpunished. And his punishment is true and righteous. They're, they're deserving. See, Santa may know who is naughty and nice, but Jesus knows who's bringing him glory and who's bringing Satan glory. God will one day judge those who oppose God and vindicate those who serve God. So, church, don't, don't worry about what the world says to you or does to you. Why, why are you worried about people who, who abuse you for your faith in Jesus Christ? That's not your problem. That's God's problem. And let me tell you something this morning. God is a problem solver. He's going to take care of your problems for you. So praise God for his salvation. I thought more people would be excited about that this morning, but I guess I'm the only one that is ready to praise the Lord. 
praise him for being the conquering king in verse three. A second time, they said hallelujah. Her smoke ascends forever and ever. You ever deal something with something in your life and you thought you had taken care of it and it just pops back up? Like, have you ever been to the doctor and they said, you need to deal with this, um, and so you do exactly what the doctor tells you to do, and then all of a sudden you have another health problem. You ever had that? It feels like it never ends, right? Some of you, you know, um, some people, you know, they deal with pornography. You say, you know, I'm serious about dealing with pornography issues in my life, so you get rid of your computer only to go in to get a soda from a convenience store, and there's like pornography magazines everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And then some of you, you shoot somebody, and you thought they're dead, and then they heal for some reason. I've been watching too much Yellowstone. Y'all just bear with me here, all right? But you get the point. In this world, there seems to be no end to a problem. There seems to be continuous problems wherever you go. And if you feel like your problems will never end, I want to introduce you to the conquering king this morning. When God deals with something, it's dealt with. It ain't coming back. And when God gives out his final judgment, there will be no coming back. In fact, if you look at verse three, it says her smoke ascends forever and ever. Not only will evil be judged, it will be judged without the possibility of parole. The city pictured here is everlasting ruin. The smoke of her burning goes up forever and ever. God lives forever and ever. So his righteous condemnation must go forever and ever as well. And we see three things that are being judged here in the scripture. We see wicked humans, wicked organizations, and wicked spirits, something we've talked about in the past couple of weeks. We will all one day go into eternal destruction. The smoke is all those who oppose God forever and ever convey also an absolute destruction, but also a picture of hell with an eternal flame, church. This is no game that we're playing. When I tell people to make a decision for Christ and they might not have tomorrow, I'm serious. This, this is no game. And some of you are feeling like, when will this ever end? When will my problems ever end? Is Jesus really worth it? So let me give you a sports analogy the best way that I can. When the clock goes to zero, God wins in the end. I read the book. God always wins, church. He is the conquering king. So play around with this world all you want to. But I will consistently praise the conquering king who conquered the grave so that I could be with him. Do you want to praise him this morning? Thirdly, we see that praise has no boundaries. Verses four and five, then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. A voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all his servants and the ones who fear him, both small and great. For the last time in scripture, we see the hallelujah chorus taking place. We previously saw the 24 elders sitting there and praising his holy name when the 144,000 followers had been singing around the throne in chapter 14, verse three. Now, one once more, we see the heavenly chorus sitting there praising his holy name. In verse 4, we see the shortest and most profound utterance with a simple amen, hallelujah. It is more simply translated, truly may it be, praise Yahweh, church. In verse 6, the praise switches from the untranslated Hebrew to the Greek when the word simply says, praise our God. We are to praise him while some of the saints have been lost in martyrdom. The ones who are left behind are to faithfully and consistently praise him. But I want you to see in scripture here the scope of praise. Look at the scope of praise. Small and great, rich and poor, male and female, young and old, we are all to praise him. You are never too old to praise him and you are never too young to learn how to praise him, church. Some of the greatest worshipers I have in this church are the ones I love. I love little uh, Bellencamp over here. You see him out there with all of his heart and his soul praising the Lord. We could learn something from children who praise with a childlike faith to praise him with everything that we have. See, this world will beat you down, and it's so easy to get wrapped up into the world and not in him. That's why I think it's good that we end this year with this passage reminding us to not get caught up in the world, but to get caught up in him. To fear him and to serve him, that means having a respect and sensitivity to God's word and his testimony. 
But unfortunately, we can praise him and blaspheme him with the same mouth, can't we? We can praise him on a Sunday only to be far from him on a Monday. The answer to that problem is to continually praise him, church. Praise him fully, verse six, it says, then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying hallelujah because our Lord God the Almighty reigns and we're about to enter the second phase of this scripture here when we get through verses six through 10. Babylon will no longer appear in Revelation. The judgment is done, it's final, it's over. Wonderful new sights await John beginning with this verse, John's attestation and, and what we're gonna see will draw to the marriage supper of the Lamb one the most beautiful things in all of scripture. But before we get there, I want to do one last hallelujah in the Bible. The mighty voice of the countless multitude attests to expressions of joy and thankfulness for being in Christ. These voices are like people who are singing softly and they, they, they just generally and eventually just raise their voices a little bit and a little bit more at a time. But let me give you the practical application of this. When I came to Christ, I knew that I wanted to give my life to Christ, but I didn't know much about Christ. Anybody else in here with me? You didn't know everything that was about. So you wanted to praise God, but you didn't know everything about God. But you know what happens when you start serving God and you start living for God? Then the, then the voice of your praise gets a little bit louder. When you go through trials in your life and you know that the trials that you used to go through in your life would beat you down and make you turn to other things in the world, but now that you have Christ, you realize that Christ can fight your battles for you, then your, then your praise gets a little bit louder, church. You know what I'm saying? And then when you're out there on the streets, like if you're not out there with us, you're missing the boat, man. You're missing the boat to go out there and see Christ. People say to me all the time, they go, I don't feel Christ. Are you living for Christ, church? Are you living for Christ? Because the more that you live for Christ, the more that you're out there seeing people who are broken and are so appreciative of you showing the love of Christ. Man, people don't want to know about what you know until they know that you care about them. And the more that you're out there, the more the Holy Spirit fills you up and the more that your praise just continues to get louder and louder. But unfortunately, I think many of our praise faucets, faucets are like a drip to keep from freezing when our praise should be overflowing constantly and consistently. Take part in what we do and to the one who reigns. See, in this scripture, Domitian was in charge. He was the emperor in charge and he wanted people to call him Lord and God. And so when the scripture tells us about the one who reigns, they're saying to the original hearers, you don't need to praise Domitian. You need to praise the one who reigns forever. The one to worship, and that is the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forever and ever. His reign doesn't have term limits, church. God's reign is not swayed by political polls. God's reign is forever and forever, and we should be full of praise. We have four more verses. Y'all with me? Three people with me this morning. Okay. The rest of y'all are hungry. All right, look. Praise him for the invitation, verse nine. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. So I'm skipping to verses seven and eight, but I'm gonna come back, all right? So I think, I think in our actions sometimes we think that God owes us something. I, I'm just, just trying to be real. This is the only attitude correction here. I talked about this this morning. I'm like, you ever give your, your kids an attitude correction? You ever done something and you're like, you gotta get them back in place? None of y'all, right? Your kids are perfect. I, okay, you know what I'm talking about. I think sometimes we treat church like something we have to do instead of something that we get to do. We're like, I wanna sleep in this morning because this is my only day off. I'm gonna, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna give God 10% of my money. He's lucky that I, I serve him. These are all things that I've heard. Let me tell you what I've had to do. I have to let people know that their attitude's in the wrong place. God is going to be praised whether you show up to church or not. He is. God doesn't need you to be here to boost his ego. The offering plate is not what is left over after your daily Starbucks run. You hear me? The offering plate 
is to give back to him a portion of what he has given to you to start with. You are blessed to serve him, not the other way around. Let me put it in the most simplest form that I can give you. Worship is his right and your privilege. It's a privilege to worship him. And I think if we came in here with the right attitude and the right heart, our worship would look a lot different. Yet, the typical church today is needing more entertainment, more gimmicks to bring people in the doors. And if you ever need more than this word to come in to this church, I ain't got nothing else for you this morning. The only thing I ever want to preach is Jesus and Jesus crucified. Is he enough for you, church? Is he enough for you? Look, praise him by being faithful during the engagement, verses seven through eight. Verse seven says, let us rejoice and be glad. They're, 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 these two are places near synonyms, only, uh, synonyms I, I felt English, so you know what I'm saying there. And are only found in two other New Testament texts, both of which are related to this. So Jesus teaching on the mount, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say evil things against you. Because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Peter's teaching on Christian suffering. Dear friends, do not be surprised. Rejoice so that you may be overjoyed with his glory is revealed. Clearly, we are to recognize the experience of Christian persecution and suffering in the life are actually an occasion to rejoice and be glad. When you go through battles in your life, when you go through persecution in your life, do you see that as an opportunity to rejoice and be glad and praise the Lord? Because you should, you should. Because clearly there's a, there's a heavenly reward for suffering. Welcome at the second coming of Christ. And so when we look at this, there's, this goes back to this Jewish wedding. Not many Jewish people in here probably, but it go back to the Jewish wedding to help you understand these verses. When somebody was engaged to be married, when they were set apart together, they were called the betrothal period. And at that point in time, although they had not been married officially and they had not consummated the marriage yet, they were considered husband and wife, even though they haven't actually been married. And then when it came time for the feast, the, the, the husband would go to the wife's house and they would bring the wife over to the, the husband's house for a consistent, joyful praise, celebration, and then they would consummate the marriage. Let me tell you something, church. The moment that you came to Christ, you were engaged to Christ. And how you live your life should be faithful to him in all that you do. And there will be a day, whether or not Christ comes back before you die or takes you home, that you will be with Christ forever. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for that day. But my question for you this morning is when Christ comes back to take you home, Will he find you to have been promiscuous or faithful? I pray that we don't fall in love with this world, but we fall in love with the word more and more every single day. Praise only him in verse 10. It says, then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I am fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. See, John was overcome with emotion, so he fell at the angel's feet. And there's so much I could say about this. But he fell at the angel's feet because he was just overcome by just the goodness of God. And I think this is a good reminder of sometimes when we come to Christ or, or God uses somebody to help lead us to Christ, that we're overcome with emotion and we end up inadvertently praising them instead of praising God. It happens so many times. So many people follow their pastor instead of their Jesus. And we see that when Paul and Barnabas, man, they, they, they were deifying them. And, God, and they literally got so upset when, when, when people were trying to deify them that they ripped their clothes and say, no, no, don't worship me, worship God. And I think it's a good reminder for us here today. Like, I've been blessed to lead a lot of you to Christ in here. God has used me to lead a lot of you to Christ in here. And sometimes you're like, Pastor, thank you for doing that. I'm like, no, no, praise him. Praise him for that. And when you lead somebody to Christ, somebody will say, man, thank you for doing that. And you got to go, no, no, praise him for doing that. You're like, no, no, you're the one. No, look, I'm just a vessel. I'm just a vessel that somebody shared Christ with me a long time ago, and I am obligated to share that same love with somebody else. So when people come to Christ continually and consistently and forever, point them to Jesus. Because here's what happens when we inevitably 
put our hope in a pastor or a person, they will always let you down. But there is one person who will never let you down, and his name is Jesus Christ. Praise him and only him. The last thing that it says is to praise him for his testimony. Y'all, I've been through seminary. I've studied every religion that has come out to date. And I can tell you that the word of God is the only one that's never been proven wrong. His testimony is true. I praise God that he doesn't backtrack on his word. I praise God that what he says, he does. And there's no ambiguity in that. I praise God that when he says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, that you shall be saved. I praise God for the hope in Christ Jesus. I praise God when he says in John 14, 6, that I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. There's no one to come through the Father except through me. I praise God for that hope. People are like, aren't you narrow-minded to think that Christ is the only way? No, I praise God that there's even a way. I praise God that there is a way, and his name is through Jesus. So look, the praise team's gonna come out, the prayer team's coming up this morning. And I think every week, if you're, if you're here, we have a prayer team, and, and if you've got prayers that are going on in your life, you've got burdens, we wanna pray with you this morning. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus, we, we wanna talk to you about have a, how to have a relationship with Jesus. But I thought as we ended this year, we got one person on the prayer team, I know somebody else is coming up. And if you ain't on the prayer team, you can be on the prayer team. But I thought it'd be a good way to end today to turn this prayer team into a praise team. What do you want to praise God for this year? Do you want to praise God for what he's kept you from, what he's delivered you from? Praise God for godly relationships. Praise God for another chance. Praise God for waking you up this morning. And then as you think about that, what do you want to praise God for in the new year? Because God is faithful to do what he says he's going to do. So I don't know what you got. We got other people that will come up here and pray with you. But I encourage you to come up and let's just offer this time of response as a praise to God. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for being a God who loves us, who never leaves us or forsakes us, a God who will always be with us. Lord, a God who saves, a God who is worthy of praise. Lord, we, we're not here to, to build up our, our church. We're up here to build up your kingdom. And Lord, your word says in Psalm 67 to, to let all the people praise you, to let all the people praise you, Lord. My heart's and desire is that everybody in Hopewell and beyond would have an opportunity to say yes or no. And Lord, the next year, this place will be full, not for our benefit, Lord, but for people praising your holy name. Let the praise of your, of your name just reign throughout this place and throughout this city and people will be banging on the doors trying to get in here and get some of what we have and his name is Jesus Christ. But they won't come in here if we don't go out there first. And so Lord, I pray that we would get comfortable being uncomfortable and get off of our seats and into the streets and share the love of Christ who has changed us and set us free, took us from a bondage of sin into the marvelous light of Christ. And Lord, for that, I am thankful. If you have nothing else to be thankful for today, be thankful for your salvation. We want to praise him as we end this year. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You guys may stand and respond to the word of God this morning.